Deglobalization and Reglobalization, written by Thanos Cyrilides. In recent years, the concepts of conflictual deglobalization and selective reglobalization have been at the forefront of the thinking of the dominant political and economic elites. In 2013, the Obama administration launched an American centric Western integration program in both the Pacific TPP and the Atlantic TTIP that excluded China and Russia. The plan with the EU collapsed in 2016 due to the lack of support from France and Germany, while the one in the Pacific was blocked by the Trump administration in 2017 because it was considered disadvantageous for America. But it was clear that in any case, a deglobalization trend had begun that would define two opposing geopolitical, geoeconomic blocks, the Sinorian and the Western Alliance. The figures of autocracies versus democracies as defined by Joe Biden. This is today's reality emerging as a trend and its constant updating serves to understand the impact on the cycle of capital in democracies. This became evident in 2022, shortages of critical materials, mineral energy, food, fertilizers, metals, etc., causing supply shortages in the Eurozone due to Russia's import blockage, blockade, with sanctions combined with supply difficulties from China. Now market players are wondering whether a return to previous globalization will be possible. This prospect is rather unlikely, even in the event of a ceasefire in Ukraine, sanctions against Russia will remain, as will the conflict with Beijing, which escalated in 2017, when America declared China an adversary by cross-party agreement, imposing tariffs and implementing check holds on strategic technology. The US-China bilateral meeting of the G20 in Bali does not change the situation, but it should be noted that China has economic difficulty and needs exports, while America is forced to import cheap goods from China to curb inflation. Under these circumstances, the complete liberalization of trade flows is not likely, but a progressive de-dependency is about reducing Euro-American dependence on certain critical materials that China exports, such as rare earths, industrial components, etc. In fact, a phase of re-establishment, quote-unquote, hence bringing back into the space of the Western democracies a range of products previously imported from China is underway. But resettlement entails higher, higher production costs. Therefore, the bloc of democracies must incorporate a friendly support, quote-unquote, that includes low-cost and controlled emerging countries. This leads to the collectivism of the global south, about 5 billion people lying between the two blocks, 3 billion in total. Cooperating will bring competition and in some cases war. The other move is to form an integrated and global market of democracy starting with the extended G7 to give each country a safe area for exports and supplies for this market to reach a sufficient scale for geopolitical pressure on the adversary bloc. The combination of these two actions could sustain a cycle of international flows of money, goods, people and information. But America is reluctant because of the prevalence of protectionism in most countries. Therefore, at this time, deglobalization is happening faster than selective reglobalization. The acceleration of the latter requires Euro-American convergence. The Western democracies and beyond are now in a process of defensive renationalization, but they will soon realize that they must consider, consolidate themselves economically and not just politically in order to survive and defeat what they've uh, designated as a rival bloc, the so-called authoritarian regimes. Although when the opposing blocs are completed, they will have to deal with the practical problem of disconnecting from each other. Disconnect and conflict? How could globalization end? Some seem to envision a relatively peaceful uncoupling of the uh, until recently tightly coupled economies, it's possible that the severance of economic ties is both the consequence and the cause of a growing global confrontation. If so, globalization is likely to end more disastrously. 
Humanity has gone through a similar phase before. Since the Industrial Revolution in the early 1970, we have had two periods of increasing cross-border economic integration and one of the reverse. The first period of globalization preceded 1914. The second began in the late 1940s, but accelerated and expanded from the late 1970s as more and more economies became integrated. In the meantime, there was a long period of deglobalization punctuated by the two world wars and deepened by depression and the accompanying protectionism. Finally, since the financial crisis of 2007-2009, globalization has neither deepened nor reversed. A contentious issue is how and to what extent peace is linked to globalization. In general, trade does not necessarily guarantee peace. The start of World War I in a period of relatively high trade proves this. Rather, causality runs in the opposite direction from peace to trade. In an era of cooperation between great powers, trade tends to increase. In an era of mutual suspicion, especially open conflict, trade is collapsing, as it is now between Russia and the West. One possible answer is that nothing like what happened during the great deglobalization of the 20th century, 1914 to 1945, could happen this time. At worst, the outcome could look a bit like the Cold War. However, this is a rather optimistic estimate. It's quite possible that the consequences of a break in relations between the great powers will be even worse in our time than in the past. One obvious reason is that today's humanity's capacity for mutual annihilation is much greater by an order of magnitude. There are studies that suggest that a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and Russia, given the possibility of a nuclear winter, could kill more than 5 billion people. Another reason the outcome may be even worse this time around is that we depend on a high level of cooperation to maintain a habitable planet. This is especially true for China and the United States, which together produce more than 40% of global CO2 emissions. The climate is a challenge par excellence for collective action. A breakdown in cooperative relations risks ending any chance of avoiding a continuing climate change process. It must therefore be understood that today's widening global divisions can hardly be contained, as was generally the case during the Cold War. A significant difference is also the fact that the Soviet economy was not integrated into the world economy, while China and the West are both at the same time competitors and integrated with each other and the rest of the world. There is no painless way to disconnect these financial ties. The effort seems certain to create conflict, so what matters will be the magnitude of that conflict. Power conflicts are what threaten the globalization the most. In seeking to increase their own security, great powers make their adversaries more insecure, creating a vicious spiral of mistrust. We are already in the spiral in the framework of which the opposing blocs are being formed. This reality will determine the fate of the global economy. So uh, this is a biomilitary, uh, to, uh, to translate this for you from a Greek article, please leave your comments and thank you for your support. Kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box.